Washington these last several weeks, the battle over what will be in and out of the federal budget has often been among Democrats as well as between Democrats and Republicans. But this week, the politicians are working on ways to reduce the federal deficit. And it looks like the president has finally got his Democrats in the Senate fairly well united. In Washington today, ABC's Jackie Judd. President Clinton tried to help out Senate Democrats nervous about voting for a budget that raises taxes and cuts popular programs. Several times today, he said his plan is universally fair, while the Republican alternative shelters the rich. The plan clearly, if you look at all their only options, will be to protect the privilege and to punish the middle class and the most vulnerable. Republicans, challenged by Mr. Clinton to come up with their own plan, finished it only late this afternoon. It has no tax increases in it at all. Our plan gets the deficit under control without raising taxes, without raising taxes, without raising user fees, as without going on a new taxpayer finance spending spree. Using props, Senator Dole claimed the plan would achieve slightly deeper deficit reductions than what is promised in the Clinton package. That would be reached, say Republicans, by freezing spending levels on all domestic programs and drastically slowing the growth of entitlement, such as Medicare. Democrats say the numbers are false and the sacrifice by anyone dependent on a government program is underestimated. I know my mama used to tell me that if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably not. Meanwhile, Democratic Party leaders met at the White House today to make sure their Senate troops are kept in line. Senator Paul Wellstone, along with several other liberals, is demanding the restoration of some Medicare cuts. He got a phone call today from the president asking for cooperation, and there was also a visit from the deputy treasury secretary. There are 56 Democrats in the Senate. About a half a dozen say tonight they are undecided. Democratic leaders say with a little tinkering of the budget and aggressive campaigning by the president, they will have the votes that they need. Jackie Judd, ABC News, Capitol Hill. The House Speaker Thomas Foley urged President Clinton today not to announce his proposals for health care reform until the budget is finally passed and sitting on the President's desk, which could be July or August. Some of Mr. Foley's colleagues made a public show today as they tried to influence what ultimately will be in the health care reform package. Here's ABC's Bob Zelnick. The House Democrats came for a meeting with Hillary Clinton trying to head off a divisive clash over health care reform. She is backing a plan called Managed Competition, where medical costs would be held down through a system of competitive bids. They favor a system called Single Payer, where health costs for all Americans would be budgeted in advance and paid by the federal government. Unlike Mrs. Clinton's plan, under Single Payer, employers would no longer have to provide coverage for employees. There would be no need for private insurance companies. A change studies show could save between 35 and 70 billion dollars per year in paperwork and other administrative costs. Supporters say the single payer system has worked well in Canada and elsewhere. Single payer has been tried and tested, and we understand how it works. Managed competition is a theory, and I, it looks terribly complex the way they're putting it together. But the administration has already concluded that the vastly expanded federal role of the single-payer system would make it a tough political sell. A notion that or a belief that our health care system has to have all the money running into government and, uh, and being paid out by government is not the way most things operate in this country. But later today, Mrs. Clinton struck a conciliatory tone toward the single-payer supporters. I am very... Uh grateful that uh, they're willing to work uh, with me so that we can try to craft a uh, health care reform proposal that uh, will do all the things that they and I and the rest of us believe need to happen. With 84 congressmen and five senators now listed as co-sponsors of a single-payer bill, the White House could be losing support among those vital to the success of its program. In seeking to beat back opponents, Mrs. Clinton must now battle to win back her friends. Bob Zelnick, ABC News, Washington. Mrs. Clinton has won an important victory this week. A federal appeals court ruled that the health care task force complied with the law when it held meetings in private. That's because the court declared Mrs. Clinton to be, in legal terms, a government official. In practical terms, it says a great deal about the new role of the First Lady. Here's ABC's Jim Wooten. This is the only Clinton on the federal payroll. But the court has now said this one is also more or less a government official, not merely a private citizen married to the president. 
Good morning, how are you? Which is the court's way of validating the historical fact of presidential spouses as presidential advisors. Unelected, but clearly not uninvolved. Mrs. Wilson, de facto president during her husband's illness. Mrs. Roosevelt, outspoken activist with a daily newspaper column. Mrs. Kennedy as cultural icon, and Mrs. Reagan as national narcotics counselor. Mrs. Clinton modestly says she has only minimum muscle. I'm just following my leader. Perhaps so, but few first ladies, if any, have ever had as much power. And the court has said that with a paid staff and a specific task, shaping health care reform, she has the power of an official government employee, therefore subject to limits and scrutiny. This is uh, a reality check. This is saying, yes, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, as the president's wife, works for the United States government. But it's against the law for a close presidential relative to work for the government. And although the court in this case did not decide whether what Mrs. Clinton is doing is technically legal or not, in this town, as sure as anything, sooner rather than later, somebody will file a lawsuit based on just that question. Jim Wooten, ABC News, Washington. When we come back, the other news. The new sanctions against Haiti trying to make the country's military rulers bend. The world's largest insurer, Lloyd's of London, drops a fortune and makes waves across the Atlantic. And on the American agenda tonight, educating the severely disabled with all the other children. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Brought to you by Whole Grain Total. In the Caribbean today, the United Nations' latest attempt to shape the politics of a nation. The UN oil embargo against Haiti has gone into effect. The intention is to force Haiti's military rulers to accept the return of Jean Bertrand Aristide, the country's first democratically elected president. Here's ABC's Mark Potter. On the streets of the capital, Port-au-Prince, residents listen closely today for news of the oil embargo. Traffic was normal, though, and gas lines were short partly because stations had already begun rationing and the military had prohibited gasoline hoarding. More critically, the country has only about six weeks of fuel left to run its vehicles and power generators. The U.S. Coast Guard is watching for tankers that might violate the embargo and will report them to the U.S. State Department. So far, none has been spotted. In addition, the sanctions call for banks in the U.S. and other countries to freeze the assets of Haiti's military and business elite. Sources in Haiti say that, more than anything else, is what will force the country's rulers to negotiate. Exiled President Aristide and General Raoul Cedres, the leader of Haiti's military which overthrew Aristide, have agreed to meet for talks. The time, place, and agenda have not been worked out, and UN officials warn that negotiations have broken down before. I'm very optimist, but you know, this has been a very long story. So I want to be all, also very cautious about this. If the UN sanctions and negotiations fail to return Aristide to power, US officials believe that some form of military intervention may be necessary, a prospect that no one wants. Mark Potter, ABC News. What happens in Haiti is clearly an important backyard issue for the United States, but a far more far-ranging concern to many officials in Washington, in both political parties, is the danger posed to many nations by weapons proliferation. The Clinton administration is now faced with the prospect of having to do something because it believes that China is violating international agreements by exporting missiles and missile technology. Here's ABC's Deborah Wong. The administration is convinced that China is shipping sensitive missile technology to Pakistan, in particular the M11. The missile has a range of at least 180 miles and could be used by Pakistan to hit cities inside neighboring India. Those concerns prompted Assistant Secretary of State Winston Lord to speak publicly. It's very disturbing evidence. It's very worrisome. We've made this very clear to our Chinese friends. The missile transfers violate a pledge the Chinese made to former Secretary of State James Baker that they would abide by agreements aimed at stopping the spread of ballistic missiles. Both China and Pakistan deny the charges, but intelligence experts say that in recent months, China has stepped up illegal sales not only of the M11, but of several other weapon systems, including the longer-range M9 missile to Pakistan, Syria, and Iran. If they go to Iran, they allow Iran to threaten 
60% of the world's oil reserves. If they go to Syria, they would allow Syria to attack any point in Israel, virtually without warning. Members of Congress argue that the violations are serious enough to trigger automatic sanctions against the Chinese under the so-called Helms Amendment. The sanctions would bar the sale to China of U.S. electronic equipment, space systems, and military aircraft worth several billion dollars. They're going to test us. They're going to push and push and push and see how much they can get by with. And I think we ought to tell them right now, this is it. Stop it. In an effort to head off a bitter confrontation, U.S. officials have asked the Chinese to provide some sort of explanation for the new intelligence reports, and they say if the Chinese do not cooperate, they will be forced to impose sanctions. Deborah Wong, ABC News, New York. In Somalia today, the United Nations has put a price on the head of the Somali militia leader, General Mohamed Idid. The United Nations won't say what the price is, but it is handing out wanted posters. In case you catch a deed yourself, the posters say bring him to UN headquarters. Door number eight. In South Africa today, Nelson Mandela and his main black political rival, Mangasutu Butelezi, met with each other for the first time in more than two years. Their supporters have been fighting and killing each other for even longer. The two men, Mandela on the left, say they will now go together into the most troubled black townships and appeal for peace. When we come back, Lloyds of London in trouble.